Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn some logic. Today we're kicking off the course with an introduction. And I think the best way of starting any course in any new subject is to ask ourselves, what is this subject and why should we care? Logic is something that we use in our everyday lives. Whether we're good at it or not remains in question. But for example, imagine that you and your roommate went out for Chinese food last night and you both got a lot of food, too much food for you to eat in one sitting, so you both bring the food back home with you in to-go containers and throw it in the refrigerator. Well, next morning arrives, and you want to eat your leftovers. So you open up the refrigerator, and you see two containers of Chinese food. You pull one out, and you see this. This is peppercorn beef. Now, you ordered sesame chicken last night, so you take this, you put it back in the refrigerator, and you grab the other container, and then without even opening it up, you throw that container in the microwave and you start cooking it. Now, what you've done there is an exercise in logic. You know that the food in the other container is either sesame chicken or pepper beef. And by virtue of the fact that you opened up the other container and you saw that there was peppercorn beef in that, in that container, you know that the other container does not have pepper beef in it. And so therefore, you're making a logical conclusion that this container that you have, that second container that is in your hands and then is thrown in the microwave, is in fact sesame chicken. Now, that is a simple application of logic, but you can apply logic to much more complicated scenarios, such as this. If the St. Louis Cardinals win the World Series, fans riot. If the St. Louis Cardinals do not win the World Series, fans do not go into work. The fans go into work or they cry about depression, cry out of depression. The fans do not riot. Well, we have a bunch of premises in that first bullet point, and then we can take those premises and work our way through them and figure out, are the fans crying out of depression or not? This is not easy to do by just looking at that big block of words, but what we're going to be doing over this course is getting really good at understanding how to compress all of this information into something that's a little bit more digestible, and then figure out how to make logical inferences off of those premises. And in fact, what we're going to be doing here in Logic 101 is essentially called sentential logic, sentential meaning sentences. So we're taking sentences and applying logic to sentences. And this is just a really fancy way of saying that we have a formal method of logical inference here. So it's a three-step program. The first step is to take premises. The second step is to apply logic. And the third step is to derive valid conclusions. Now, premises are just the things that you know are true and you're taking as given as being true. Conclusions are what you want out of it. And what Logic 101 is going to teach you is how to apply that second step properly. And this is the difference between someone who's smart and someone who looks like a complete idiot, is being able to actually use logic appropriately and make sure that the premises that you have are actually giving you the conclusions that you believe that they are giving you. And sometimes sentential logic is called propositional logic. Same thing here. Now, you might be wondering who should take this course. Well, the short answer is it's going to be everyone. But just to go through this, lawyers should take this course. And the reason for that is twofold. First, if you're going to be a lawyer, you need to take the LSAT. And if you're going to take the LSAT, then you're going to have a section called logic games. Logic games are these sorts of things like Adriana is scheduling a dinner party. There's a round table with six seats. Adriana, Brian, and blah, blah, blah are attending. Brian must sit to the left of Adriana. Charles must not sit across from Edgar. Edgar and Fred must have exactly one person sitting between them and so forth. And you have to figure out where the people are sitting based off of the information that you give you, they give you. Well, this is an application of logic, right? There are a bunch of premises that are given in the questions and the answers or rather the, the questions that you have to answer are asking you to apply the premises and draw logical conclusions based off of those premises. So this is an exercise of Logic 101. It's also important, and the reason that they actually ask this in the LSAT, is for when a person is actually in their career as a lawyer, lawyers are not supposed to take extra premises that aren't on the table to derive their conclusions. They're supposed to take the pre-existing premises that the law gives, apply them, and derive conclusions based off of that. So these LSAT logic games are there to test one's ability to make this sort of reasonable argument. I actually got started in logic because I thought I wanted to be a lawyer, and I thought this would help me both in my career and in LSAT, or and on the LSAT. As it turns out, I realized I didn't want to be a lawyer. I switched to being a social scientist, and well, now I'm a social scientist, and I'm still using this logic, and in fact, it might even be more valuable to me as a social scientist who is tasked with creating theories based off of premises. I have a bunch of premises that I assume are true, and then I want to work through those premises and draw some sort of causal argument which leads to a conclusion, and I use logic to do that. So very important to use logic in social sciences. 
If you're a mathematician, well, you're using logic with numbers. So if you don't understand basic logic and you throw in numbers there, you're only going to make your life even more difficult for yourself. You need to understand logic to be a mathematician. Well, philosophers also need to understand logic. In fact, philosophers are in the same boat as social scientists here, really. And moreover, if you take logic in a university, you're almost certainly going to be taking it out of the philosophy department. Who else uses it? Well, programmers use it. In computer language, we have computers thinking logically. Computers don't think for themselves. They think the way that they're programmed to think, and they're programmed to think in a logical manner. And so if you don't understand logic and you're trying to program a machine, you're going to be programming it wrong. You're going to be programming it to do illogical things or the things that you don't want it to do. That's bad for you and a waste of your time. If you're a programmer, you need to understand logic. And even if you're a weak programmer, you use Excel every now and then, you need to understand logic because all of the really useful and cool functions apply logic to the cells that you are treating them with. And this is especially true for what might be the most useful function of all, the if-then function in Excel. If you use Excel and you don't understand the if-then function, you should probably pause this video and go learn what that is and then come back here. But if you're going to be using Excel, you need to understand the if-then log if logical statement, which then, of course, requires you to understand logic, which is why you're here right now if you're someone who uses Excel quite frequently. And then lastly, well, people who don't want to sound completely stupid should take logic. So to summarize here, if you live on this planet, you should be taking this course. And well, you are right now by virtue of the fact that you're listening to my voice. So congratulations to you. And in fact, if I can get on my soapbox for a moment, understanding logic really ought to be a prerequisite for doing anything in life that's remotely relevant. If you want to make a contribution to humanity, if you want to do things other than eating and sleeping, you really need to understand logic. And by virtue of that fact, it's really amazing that this sort of thing isn't taught in high schools. We spend four years in math, four years in English, three or four years in science, three or four years in social, study, social studies or history, and we spend absolutely no time, not a semester, not even a quarter, understanding logic. And yet logic drives all of these things. It drives math, it drives social science, it drives everything that you're going to be doing that's relevant, yet you don't learn it. So this is an opportunity for you to learn it if you didn't catch it in your university setting. Grading for this course, well, if you're taking this course, then you get an A. If you're watching this video, then you're taking this course. You're listening to my voice right now, so you're watching this video, and aha, I am going to make a logical conclusion here. I have taken some premises. I can now derive a conclusion that you are getting an A in this course. Congratulations. We'll see how this logic flows in later videos. And to wrap things up here, who am I? As I said at the beginning, my name is William Spaniel. I'm a PhD candidate in political science at the University of Rochester. I'm a game theorist by trade. Game theory is an application of logic in strategic settings. So I need to understand logic as a prerequisite for doing even fancier things. That's why I am teaching this course right now, because I have to understand logic. And I think everyone should understand logic, especially if they're going to be doing things like me, uh, things like game theory, uh, like I do. And you probably already know me if you're watching this from my Game Theory 101 series, which is an application of that strategic logic. And then lastly, uh, as a quick note, I study bargaining over nuclear weapons. That's what my main research agenda is all about. So that wraps up this lecture. And in the next lecture, we're going to continue our introduction by looking at an overview of what this course will be covering. Join me then.